Take your Bible, turn to John chapter 11. That's where we left off this morning. Lazarus is dead. <clears throat> and Martha has been talking to the Lord. She's, uh, you know, basically said, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. So uh, Jesus told her uh, he's going to rise. Look at John chapter 11. <clears throat> Look at verse 23. The Bible says, Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this. So that's the discussion that they had this morning. So we're going to pick up where we left off. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the evening. Bless the message. Help us to glean the wonderful truths that are here in the Bible. Help us to put them into practice. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, beloved, it is interesting to note that the Hebrew language teaches the truth of the resurrection in the word for life. It is the word Hayim. Hayim. The word for life ends with Yim. Y I M. Which is the grammatical indication of plurality. When it has the Yim at the end of the word, it means it's a plural word. So we are granted not one life, but two lives. The word is not Hay, it is Hayim. In fact, the Jewish Torah, which consisted of the first five books of the Old Testament, it begins with the letter uh, Bet, which corresponds to the number two. Jewish sages, they teach that God created not one world, but two worlds. He created this world and the world that is yet to come for eternity. People will either live in heaven or hell based upon what they have done with Jesus Christ. Their relationship with Jesus Christ is going to determine where they're going to spend eternity. If you reject Jesus, let me say right tonight, you reject heaven. If you don't trust him as Savior, you're not going to his heaven. Those are his terms. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. So if you reject Jesus Christ and die without him, the Bible says you'll spend eternity in a lake of fire forever. But if you accept him, you'll spend eternity in heaven. Your home will be in heaven. He's preparing those homes right now. And you will have eternal life. So all it's up to what you're going to do, what decision you're going to make. You know, the term, the term I am is a reference to God in the Bible. For example, in Exodus 3.14, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt, the, the, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent, me unto, sent you unto you. Uh, this term is used in reference to the Lord around 20 times. You look through the Bible, and Jesus is constantly saying, I am this, I am that. He said, I am the bread, I am the light, I am the good shepherd, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the true vine. The person who put, puts his trust in Jesus Christ for the salvation of his soul will never die the second death. If you want to go to heaven when you die, and you never know when you're going to die. Man, I watched a plane yes, or two days ago just cascade down from the sky and crash in South America. It's one of the most tragic things I've, I've ever seen, to witness the plane actually crashing there in those homes. 62 people died. They're still trying to figure out what happened. So you just never know when you're going to die. Kids die all the time. Kids drown in, drown in swimming pools. Kids get bitten up by, by sharks. Uh, adults have heart attacks. 
I uh, went by uh, uh, went by a Walmart the other day, and the ambulance going into Walmart, man, that's a common sight anymore, you know. Maybe it's sticker shock of the prices. I don't know, but and stuff. But uh, Brian, lower them prices, okay? But uh, you know, you just never know when your death's going to come your way. You just don't know. You never, you never, you need to be ready. And the only way you can be ready. When death comes your way, unexpectedly, is put your faith in Jesus Christ. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Ask Him to cleanse you. And tell the Lord you're trusting Him to take you to heaven. You're trusting Him for eternal life. And the Bible says if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says... He will give you His gift of eternal life. He'll save your soul. He'll give you a home in heaven. You get to live with Him for eternity. It's not anything you do. It's, all, it's what He's already done on the cross for you and me. You know, Revelation 21.8 says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Jesus said, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Jesus brought Martha to a point of decision and declaration. That's what he's doing right here. This was a fork in the road question that forces all of us to face ourselves about what, about what we are and what we truly believe. What do you believe and what are you? Do we realize we are rudderless sinners in a tailspin to disaster? Or do we believe we're good enough for heaven because we are self-righteous and pompous? Our decision will determine our eternal destiny whether we will live in heaven or whether we burn in hell forever. Well, Martha was told the truth. Now she needed to apply it in her life. And that is what all of us are to do when we read, when we study, and when we hear the preaching of God's Word. We are to act upon God's Word and apply it in our behavior and in our attitudes. It's not enough just to hear it or to put it into practice. That's how you grow spiritually. That's how you please the Lord. If you want to please Christ in your life, put His Word into, into practice. Obey His Word. The Scriptures are to guide our lives. They are, are the blueprint for living our lives. The Word of God. Get in this book and get in it every day by the grace of God. Psalm 119.105 says this, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus said, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now the question is, do you believe that? I do. Max Lucado said, Christ has called us to come out of the cemetery. He comes and calls us out. We are the corpse. And he is the corpse caller. <laughs> we are the dead and he is the dead raiser. Our task is not to get up, but to admit that we are dead. Admitting that we are lost in sin. Admitting that we are spiritually dead. If we don't admit that, we're not going to come to Christ. We must acknowledge that we are sinners in a need of a Savior. We need Jesus if we are to enjoy eternal life. He has promise. Now, do you believe in Him and His promise of eternal life? That's the question. So now we come to the next thing. Look at John chapter 11. Look at verse 27. We see the reasoning of Martha. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Man, what a statement here. Martha responds to the Lord's promise in faith. 
And she believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. She didn't beat around the bush at all. She didn't say, well, I think so, or maybe I believe that. No, she doesn't say that at all. Her declaration of faith was emphatic, dogmatic, dynamic, fantastic, terrific, ballistic, majestic, unapologetic, and enthusiastic. I don't know about you, but I like this Martha girl right here. I like her. She's got some spunk. You know, this is a wonderful testimony from Martha. It should characterize our profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Here's an example that we should follow. This girl was bold in her belief in Christ. Do you believe this too about Jesus, what she said? The confession of both Peter and Martha became part of the granite foundation of the church of Jesus Christ. Martha, she confessed that Jesus is, was the Messiah. He was the Christ. She confessed that Jesus was God, the Son of God. She confessed that He was the Savior which should come into the world. And she confessed uh, about the incarnation of Jesus who came into the world. She believed all of that. What Martha professed, however, was unpopular. And it's still unpopular today. Many do not believe that Christ is, is the Son of God. And if they die without the Lord, some of them may be family and friends of yours. The Bible says if they don't trust in the Lord, they're going to spend, spend eternity in a place called hell. And they'll never get out. See, that's why Christ came to die on the cross for us, so that we would not have to go to that place. You know, something else. What Martha confessed was not only unpopular, it was also uncomfortable. Peer pressure. From the world makes it difficult for people to proclaim their faith in Jesus Christ because they're worried about what the crowd thinks instead of what the Christ thinks. They fear ridicule. They fear the loss of acceptance. Listen, beloved, if you're going to be anything for God, you're going to have to get over that stuff. Christ needs to be the most important person in your life. Martha's declaration demonstrated undaunted courage and will. See, in, in Jesus' time, Christ was, he was hated. They hated his guts. They were trying to kill him. Powerful people sought to kill him. And those who followed Jesus were in the same boat. They were targeting Christians too. Uh, Christians in the early church, they lost their friends. They lost their income, membership in the synagogue, and even their lives because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But opposition did not deter Martha here. We'll call her Magnificent Martha. Amen. She just kept on trucking, okay? Now, how, the, how did Martha, how did she come to this conclusion about Jesus that He is the Christ, the Son of God? Well, she made some changes in her life. And she chose the good part that would not be taken away from her. And that's what Jesus told her that she needed to do. She adjusted her priorities and not only was blessed, she became a great blessing and a courageous disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, when you put Christ first in your life, you're not only going to be a blessing to the Lord, you're going to be a blessing to other people who rub shoulders with you. And that's what it's all about. That's what makes the Christian life so exciting is being a blessing and loving other people and pointing them, pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ who can save their soul, change their life, give them a home in heaven, give them hope for eternity. Christ does that for, for each person. You know, John 3.17 says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's why He came into the world. He wants to save the lost souls of sinners. That's why He died on the cross and rose from the grave, so that they could have eternal life. But listen, the sinner's got to make a decision. He either accepts what Christ has done, or he rejects Him. So the question is, will you accept Jesus if you don't know Him as your Savior? 
You know, Joanne Shelter was a Bible translator from the Bolongo people in the Philippines. She, when she came to John 3.17, which we ju just read, she sought for a word for, for save. She was looking for a word for save that was in their language. She was able to find the right word by describing a court case to some of her friends. She described it to the people. And she said, okay, if a lawbreaker is brought before a tribal council in the village to be judged and then punished for an offense, but is released after a lawyer pleads his case, then what did the lawyer or advocate do for that accused person? What did he do? Explain it to me. And the Bolongo people reply, the advocate or the lawyer made the man to stand. He made the man to stand. So after hearing this, Joanne translated John 3.17, God did not send his son to earth to sentence people to punishment, but, neither to make, but rather to make them stand. See, they would understand that. So let me ask, are you standing for Jesus Christ? Are you standing in his love and grace? Manny, are you walking with the Lord each day as we've been teaching and preaching on all year long? Well, we see something else here. Look at John eleven twenty eight. 28. We see the run to meet Jesus. John eleven twenty eight. And when she had said so, when Martha had said so, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. She ran to Jesus. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. And the Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she arose up hastily and went out, they followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down. She fell down at his feet. She fell down at Jesus' feet. And she said unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Well, Martha returns and informs Mary that the Lord is calling for her. Such news would be, that would be comforting to Mary. The help and comfort from Christ does wonder for any person. Listen, if you're having a tough time in your life, I'm going to tell you what, you can find comfort in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you need to take, you need to take the time to spend some time with him. Talk to him, pray. If you've got a broken heart, tell him. If you're scared, tell him. Listen, I do. If I'm scared, I say, Lord, I'm scared. Uh, this bridge is spooky and this truck is in my truck. You know, I mean, help me. If you're scared, you talk to the Lord. The, uh, the Lord may have sought to comfort her and teach her some things right here. The invitation of Jesus to Mary is given to all of us. He is our source of comfort and salvation. And he's extended that, sal that, that invitation to all mankind. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor are heavy laden, and I'll do something for you. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. That's what Jesus says to all of us. Well, Mary, she arose quickly to meet Jesus. And for this reason, it's believed that she was not informed about his arrival when Martha met the Lord. So when Mary took off hastily, just like that, her friends assumed she was going to the grave to cry, to weep for her brother. But that was not the case. 
at all. The people followed her. When Mary finds Jesus, she falls at his feet, proclaiming the exact same thing that Martha said. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Her eyes may have been filled with confusion. Her brother was dead, and the person who could have made a difference, he didn't. At least not yet. As we will see, he will make a difference because Jesus is on a different timetable than we are. His timetable is not the same as yours. You've got a stopwatch and he's got a calendar, as we have said before. He does things at his own time in his own way. Now that's when you need to trust his timetable. Stop rushing the Lord. Maybe he doesn't want to be rushed. Maybe he has something special planned for you. Well, Mary was very devoted to Jesus, and she demonstrated her devotion and love when she sat at Jesus' feet. She demonstrated her loyalty to Jesus. And you know what? When she anointed his feet with costly ointment, and when she ran to meet him when he summoned her, she was showing the attitude that she had toward Jesus Christ. Jesus was first in Mary's life, not her guests. It was the Lord. So now we come to the next point. Look at John eleven thirty three, 33, the reaction of Jesus. Okay, now how's the Lord going to respond to her? How is he going to treat this woman? Look at John eleven thirty three. 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, the Bible says, look at this, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. All right, it's talking about Jesus now. He groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And here, the Bible says in verse 35, Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. Jesus groaned in his spirit and was troubled when he saw the people weeping. The weeping was loud, loud crying, wailing cries. Jesus groaned when he heard this. Now what does this mean, he groaned? The word groan, it comes from the word ambra amomai. The word indicates this. That word groan means a very strong display of emotion, of being upset, angry, even stern. That's what's going on right now with the Lord. In fact, this word was used to describe the snorting of a horse as in the excitement of battle or pulling a heavy load. John continues to tell us that to, to, uh, he continues to tell us that the word, the Lord was also he was troubled. Now what does that mean? The Lord's troubled? Yeah, that's what it said. It comes from the word terasso, which means stirred, agitated, <clears throat> or disturbed like a like a pool of water. The Lord was not thrilled with what was going on here with all these broken-hearted people who were crying. He was not thrilled at all. He was not a happy camper. Now why? He may have been angry at the pain and misery that sin and death have caused. He may have been angry with Satan too. The Bible says Jesus wept. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to memorize a verse, start with this one. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. Two words. You can, you can say, uh, when you go home tonight, and you say, man, I memorized a verse in church tonight. Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five, 35. And that's what this is. Uh, the tears of those he loved moved him to tears as the people wept. 
our Lord began to weep. He was very compassionate. Did Jesus cry in other places of Scripture? The answer is yes, he did cry. The word wept here is not the same word for wept in verse 33. The word here means when he wept, it was a, a quiet grief. Uh, to shed tears, but it was not a loud wailing and screaming. It wasn't like that. He just, the tears just began to flow from his eyes. You know, we have no record, get this, we have no record of Jesus laughing in the Bible. It's not there. No record of Jesus laughing in the Bible. We do have three examples of his crying. We find tears of sorrow in Luke 19, 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and he wept over it. Uh, he shed tears of suffering over the city of Jerusalem. He said, shed tears of sympathy in this verse here. Charles Spurgeon preached two messages on Jesus wept. He said, there is infinitely more in these two words than any sermonizer or student of the word will ever bring out of them, even though he should apply the microscope of the utmost attentive consideration. These verses teach several lessons about the Lord. First of all, it shows that God notices our tears. Listen, when you're brokenhearted and crying, the Lord notices that. He's very aware about that when you're brokenhearted and crying. If you fall down and hurt yourself or on your bike and stuff and you're crying, the Lord notices that. He knows what's going on. And you know, Job said in Job 34, 28, He heareth the cry of the afflicted. Thank God for that. Psalm 34, 15. The eyes of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his, he, he, and his ears are open to their cry. You know, <clears throat> something else about these tears. It shows that the Lord was a man who understand, understood sorrow and grief. When you have sorrow in your life, when you have grief, He understands that. Even though He's at the right hand of God the Father, He understands that. The Bible says in Isaiah 53.3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. The fact that God should cry was mind-boggling to the Greeks. The Greeks could not understand this, why God would cry. To the Greeks, God was apatheia, uh, which means he had total inability to feel any emotion at all. They believed that God did not feel any emotion. They believed, uh, uh, they believed to, feel, to feel sorrow, joy, gladness, or grief means a person can have an effect upon you. That's what the Greeks believed. They felt that no one could affect or have power over God, so they felt that God was incapable of feeling. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to mark it down tonight. He's very capable of feeling. He knows what you're going through and He feels for you. You know, they believe that the, God was passionless, passionlessness and without compassion. But that is not true at all. Jesus proved to be the opposite of that belief. This is one of the reasons that He came to earth so man could see God in the flesh and his love for mankind. Jesus came into this world so that we could see what God was like. So that we could know him. So that we could see he loves us. He cares about us. He's concerned about us. And, he sh and, and when he came to this world, he showed us the power that he has too. You know, in the book, Be Still America, Amy Bartlett states that while flying during the days before September 11th, 2001, William Fay stuck up, uh, struck up a conversation with a flight attendant and felt deeply impressed
to share Jesus Christ with her, to tell her about the Lord on the plane. As an evangelist, such promptings were not uncommon, but there was a, a very strong urgency about this particular encounter. He felt the Spirit of God just really screaming at him and said, you've got to talk to this woman. So he gave the stewardess on the plane, he gave her a gospel tract about Cassie Bernal, that Christian teenager who died for Christ, uh, because he was a chaplain in the Denver Police Department when the Columbine shootings occurred, and it was a story close to his heart. So he's talking to the spirit. He gives the gospel track to her, and the, the, the stewardess, she responded quickly, quickly. She said, you know, this is weird, she said. You are, get this, you are the sixth person to hand me one of these things in the last two weeks. Why did you give this to me, she said. Well, garage door just opened. That opened the door for him to tell her about the love of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for her sins and what he did for her. Christ's love grabbed her attention and grabbed her gratitude. And that day, that stewardess on that plane trusted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. God was trying to get her attention, trying to reach her. And soon after that, she died in one of those hijacked planes on September 11th. Just a few days later. Aren't you glad that God's concerned about us? You know, let me ask, where will you be when you spend time in eternity? By the way, if you were on that plane that crashed in one of those towers and you died, where would you go? Would you be in heaven? Huh? Are you bold like Martha in your testimony for Jesus Christ? Many of you are Christians here tonight. Are you bold in your witness for Christ? We need that. Is there someone you need to speak to about Jesus that needs the Lord? Maybe a friend or someone in your family. Well, then talk to them. But I don't know the words. Hey, I'll tell you what. If you'll go out in the lobby and grab one of those gospel tracts, just read the track. Just read the track to your friend. Get two of them, and you can read it together. You don't have to be a preacher, but you do need to have a love and compassion for their soul. And you need to know the Lord yourself, too. But you know what? There are people that need the Lord, and we have a job to tell them about Christ. I hope that you will do what God wants you to do.